Hey everyone, me again, Laszlo Montgomery, China History Podcast, episode 180. The earliest years of Christianity in China this time. We already took a nice, shallow dive back in episode 98 on the life and times of the Jesuits who began coming to China in the mid-16th century, starting with Ricci and Ruggieri. But long before the Jesuits, however, there were others who played roles small and large, in the early propagation of Christianity in China. It was a hard sell back then, and the religion couldn't have appeared more alien in the eyes of the Chinese of antiquity. Jesus, not being Chinese, that alone made it difficult for the locals to embrace it as readily as Buddhism and Taoism. But that didn't stop these fishers of men who came from the lands of Christendom with their piety, their zeal, and industry to bring the teachings of their Lord Jesus Christ to the people of China, and of course to everyone else in between Europe and the Far East. So let's take a look at the efforts of these missionaries from the earliest centuries of Christianity. From time to time, you'll hear me mention Nestorian Christians. They're at the center of today's episode. I don't want to get into any of the aspects of religious doctrine or anything like that. But the Nestorians had a different theology from what the Western Church had. Nestorius was ordained as Patriarch of Constantinople in 428. In short, he was declared a heretic at the Third Ecumenical Council in 431. But Nestorius had a lot of followers, and they ended up splitting with the Church. And these were the ones who, as we'll see, were the first to bring the good news to China. Prior to the Catholic and Protestant missionary movements of the 19th century that we're all mostly familiar with, there were a total of three comings of Christianity in China. And we'll see in each of the three cases, they began with the support of a powerful and enlightened sponsor. And then because of political events going on in China and changes made at the top, Christianity got swept away from the Middle Kingdom. After the crucifixion in the year 30 CE, there followed the apostolic age, the time when the apostles of Jesus left the Holy Land and went out into the world. These earliest missionaries of Christ went to Antioch in southern Turkey, near the border with Syria, to Alexandria and Egypt, all over Asia Minor, Cyprus, Syria, Greece, Libya, Rome, Carthage, southern Gaul, Spain, and Roman Britain. And besides these biblical locations and places on the North African and European continent, the apostles also went east. And in this eastern part of the world, Mesopotamia, Media, Persia, Parthia, Bactria, and India, the apostles preached and established beachheads that would later go on to thrive, or in many cases, die out. In 301, Armenia became the first country to adopt Christianity as the state religion. Ethiopia was second. Ten years later came one of the most pivotal early moments for Christianity when in 311, the Roman Emperor Constantine, a.k.a. Constantine the Great, converted to Christianity. Two years later, in 313, came the Edict of Toleration that legalized Christianity throughout the Roman Empire. One momentous event after another happened during the 4th century. The Council of Nicaea in 325, death of Constantine in 337, dividing the Roman Empire. The Second Ecumenical Council in 381, the Council of Rome in 382, and in the translation of the Vulgate Bible into Latin in 391. Theodosius I, who reigned from 379 to 395, was the last Roman emperor to rule over both the eastern and western halves of the empire. Under Theodosius the Great, Christianity was made the official state religion in the western Roman Empire, and it remained the official state religion of the eastern Roman Empire until the fall of Constantinople in April 1453. Between Constantine and Theodosius, that was a massive boost to the future prospects of Christianity. This History, well, many of us already studied in their Western Civ classes in high school. By the 6th century, though they didn't get to meet face-to-face much, 
Both the Chinese and peoples to the west of Asia both knew about each other. The world, comparatively speaking, that is, wasn't such a large place anymore. The 600 years of back and forth along the Silk Roads had busted things wide open in many respects. The idea of walking or riding 5,000 miles wasn't as scary and outrageous as it had once been. But despite all that relative efficiency of travel, you didn't see Christian missionaries taking advantage of or benefiting from the growth of this Silk Road trade route. It brought a lot of ideas into and out of China, but the Christian faith, surprisingly, was not one of them. Some of you may recall from that last episode on the history of silk around the year 550, a couple of Nestorian monks, after doing God's work down in India, came up to Sogdiana and secreted some silkworm eggs into the hollow of their walking staffs and brought this precious cargo back to Byzantium. They had probably picked up these silkworm eggs in Samarkand or Bokhara, and from there brought them back to their emperor. Now, these Nestorian monks on a mission from Justinian I were not Christian missionaries who went to China to preach the gospel. And the exact details, this being the 6th century and all, are not very reliable. All we know for sure was that after the year 550, and after a ramping up period, the Byzantine silk industry suddenly took off in spades. So if it wasn't these silkworm egg-stealing Nestorian monks... When did the first Christians actually go to China to do their work? Well, that much we do know. In 1625, or thereabouts, not exactly sure, a nine-foot-tall, two-ton black limestone stele, or monument, was dug out of the ground, not too distant from the city of Xi'an. This stele told us the exact date of Christianity's first arrival into China. You might recall from that old episode on the Kaifeng Jews, there were also these stone steelies involved that shed some light on the fortunes and misfortunes of that ancient community in China. In this particular stone tablet dug out of the ground outside Xi'an in the late Ming Dynasty, the 18 and 1900 Chinese characters and Syriac writing carved into this Nestorian stele, as it has come to be known, told the story of the monk Alopan, or Alopan in Mandarin, who came to China in the year 635. Alopan is generally agreed by most everyone to have been the first Christian missionary to come to China. This was 944 years before Michel Ruggieri and Matteo Ricci landed in Macau to start their mission. So let's talk about this limestone stele, the Nestorians, and how they ended up in Tang Dynasty, China. The top of the stele shows an Nestorian cross, resting on a lotus flower. Below that are the words, Da Qin, Jing Jiao, Liu Xing, Zhong Guo Bei. Let me give you two translations of how that reads. It can be, A monument commemorating the propagation of the Da Qin luminous religion of China, or, The story of the coming of the religion of light from the West to China. The religion of the Church of the East, or Nestorian Church, as it's sometimes called, in Chinese is pronounced Jingjiao. The different forms of Christianity all have their own Chinese names. Uh, Roman Catholicism is called Tianzhujiao, the religion of the Lord of Heaven. Eastern Orthodox is Dongzhengjiao, the religion of Eastern Truth. And Protestantism is Jidujiao. Jidu means the Christ, and Jiao means religion or teaching. It's also called Xinjiao, or the new religion. They all have different names. The 7th century monk, Alopen, couldn't have picked a more perfect time to go to China than the year he arrived, 635. Now, I've mentioned the following name in many past CHP episodes, and he's even made it to episodes in the Chinese Sayings podcast. He was the co-founder of the Tang Dynasty, Li Shermin, a.k.a. the Taizong Emperor. Tang Taizong, he was a great warrior, scholar, emperor. And when Alopen pulled into town, this emperor was in the ninth year of his reign. There were emperors who reviled foreigners in their culture, and those who embraced them. The Tang Taizong Emperor 
was one of those who was open to ideas brought to China from elsewhere and welcomed anyone with something useful and valuable for his empire. And when Alopen arrived at the Tang court, it wasn't just anyone who personally welcomed him there. It was none other than Fang Xuanling who received him and brought him to the palace to meet the emperor. In Chinese history, the Duke of Zhou, Zhou Gong, we looked at him before in a previous episode, he's universally regarded as the model regent for all those who followed him. Fang Xuanling and his colleague Du Ruhui in the Tang became the future role models for how a chancellor should properly serve their emperor. When this first Christian missionary arrived in Chang'an, the most splendid and magnificent city in the world back in the early 7th century, it wasn't just anyone who took care of him. It was Fang Xuanling. He was the one to whom Alopen explained his faith and what it was all about. He must have done a good job given his pitch because Fang Xuanling saw enough importance in this religion from the West to arrange to have the gospel translated. And then later, in an audience with the emperor and other high-ranking court officials, Alopen got his chance to present it. And the tolerant and open-minded Taizong emperor, he gave it the thumbs up and allowed this new religion to flourish. Now, by the year... 638, the religion Alopen preached, had gained acceptance at the highest levels in the palace. Now, that didn't mean court officials were lining up to get baptized. This wasn't possible, given the circumstances and dynamic of the Tang court. But foreign faiths needed some kind of approval and protection by the government to set up shop and start proselytizing to converts and, you know, begin getting the word out. You know, most all of the converts these Nestorian monks harvested were Sagdian or other Central Asians living in or passing through Chang'an. Although there were certainly a few converts, there's no record of Christianity catching fire and spreading amongst the Han Chinese. Although I'm betting it wasn't for lack of trying on the part of these Nestorians. By proclamation from the Emperor Taizong, Alapen was also granted the approval to build a monastery and to gather 21 monks. That's how the first church got built. Then, a little over a hundred years after Alapen, in the year 781, a local merchant, a Persian Christian, funded the production of this limestone stele and had it placed in the monastery. Now, the Chinese and Syriac writing carved on this stele commemorated the work of Alapen, and in the words of a monk named Jing Jing, Alopen's story is told as far as how he came from Dachin, or Rome, to China, and his dealings with the imperial court, how he presented the gospel to Emperor Taizong, and how he and other missionaries carried out their work in and around Chang'an. It specifically mentions that from Alopen's humble beginnings, the Nestorians had spread the religion to the ten provinces of China and that monasteries had been built in a hundred cities. The stele is very clear about the date of Alopen's arrival being 635. So this one mention, carved in a slab of limestone, unearthed in 1625 by sheer chance, confirms with a degree of absolute certainty the earliest evidence of a presence of Christians in China. 1,382 years ago from this 2017 vantage point. As I said, this was a time of religious tolerance in China, 7th century and into the 8th. Nestorians mixed freely with people from other faiths, Jews, Zoroastrians, Manichaeans, Hindus. And in 635, when Alopen first arrived in Chang'an, it had been merely 13 years since the Hijri, when the Prophet Muhammad and his followers migrated from Mecca to Medina. And this new religion, called Islam, that was emerging in Arabia, would, beginning in the 8th century, transform almost the entire face of Western and Central Asia. But during Alopen's time in Chang'an, modern-day Xi'an, everyone got along. And none of the bad blood that would follow over the centuries had been spilled yet. These were all traders, scholars, men of God, all arriving via the fabled Silk Roads, and they mingled together peacefully and 
carried out their business, learning, or preaching. In the early 20th century, a man named Fritz Holm, a renowned adventurer in his day who worked out of the Danish consulate in New York, had what I guess you can call a fascination about this Nestorian tablet. He went to China towards the final years of the Qing dynasty and spent time in Xi'an studying this stele. In 1907, Fritz Holm called the Nestorian tablet, quote, the most valuable historical monument in the world that has not, as yet, been acquired by any museum or scientific society or corporation, end quote. Holm attempted to purchase the original by, quote, applying to the local authorities in an indirect manner. But although the Chinese do not care more today for the stone than any ordinary brick, they at once got suspicious, and I might as well have endeavored to lift the Rosetta Stone out of the British Museum or take the Moabite Stone from the Louvre as to carry away the Jingjiao Bei from Xi'an, end quote. Jingjiao Bei being the Nestorian tablet. A Bei is a, is a stele or a stone tablet or monument. So after being denied in his request to purchase the Nestorian tablet... He arranged to have a replica carved exactly like the original, including using the same limestone from the hills of Fuping County in Shanxi. Then this replica eventually got shipped off to New York, and henceforth copies were made available to all scholars worldwide involved in the research of the early spread of Christianity during the late Roman Empire. When he beheld the stone and pondered its significance, its story, and the fate of this stele. Holm later wrote, quote, But the stone stands there, lonely in all kinds of weather, and only the very rare traveler who gets as far as Xi'an, or an occasional missionary, pays the Jingjiao Bei a visit of a short duration. End quote. Anyways, if you want to see it today, you'll have to go to Xi'an, to the Beilin Guan near the Xi'an Wenchang Gate. Beilin means the Forest of Monuments. At this museum, it's, it's a place where all these steles and all kinds of other stone sculptures are warehoused and displayed. So Christianity, and other religions as well, enjoyed a nice period of tolerance that allowed them to spread the word and begin the work that, that's still going on today. But like I said, there were times when emperors were tolerant and not so tolerant. Under these kinds of circumstances, the situation for the earliest Christians in China was always precarious and could turn on a dime. And in the case of the Nestorians, these very first Christians to visit the Middle Kingdom, that's exactly what happened. February 20th, 840, began the six-year reign of the Tang Wuzong Emperor. Now, he was a world-class religious persecutor. Buddhism had enjoyed one of its most golden ages during the Tang Dynasty. But now, with this emperor, a dark age began for Buddhism in China. Wu Zong was a very devout Taoist, and he was surrounded by Taoist advisors as well, who had quite a bit of influence over this 26-year-old emperor. The Taoists and the Buddhists had always been fierce competitors at the imperial palace, the religious persecution carried out under Wu Zong was mainly focused on the Buddhists and confiscating much of their property and assets, which were considerable at this time in the Tang Dynasty. Over 4,500 temples were destroyed or confiscated. Shrines were emptied and monks and nuns were cast out from their temples. Buddhist properties and treasures seized by the state brought in vast sums to the imperial treasury. It all culminated in the year 842 with an edict that began putting a lot of restrictions on many Buddhist practices. By 845, it had spread to all of these foreign religions, and everyone got caught up in the net. Christians, Zoroastrians, Muslims, everyone. So let's say from 635 to 845, 210 years, the Nestorian Christian monks, missionaries, and ecclesiastics kept the light shining in Tang China. This Beth Xinya, as it was called, the Church of the East in China, had grown so big that it had become one of the provinces of the Church of the East. But we'll see, after 845, with everyone gone, this part of the Church of the East will no longer show up as being active on any church documents. 
It just disappeared off the face of China. One Nestorian traveling in Song Dynasty China in the year 981 had written that there was no evidence whatsoever anywhere of a Christian presence. And further to this, a little sidebar to our early history of Christianity in China, down in Guangzhou, an Arab, Abu Zayid Hassan al-Sarafi, wrote that during the Huangchao uprising in 877-878, something like 120,000 foreigners of the Christian, Zoroastrian, Muslim, Jewish, and Manichaean faiths, they all suffered the same fate in what became known as the Guangzhou Massacre. So, early Tang Dynasty, that was the first time Christianity came to China and tried to take hold. After the Wuzong Emperor, things were very quiet in China as far as Christianity was concerned. It had taken one Chinese emperor to allow Christianity to flourish and another one to snuff it out. Then, after a 400-year gap in the action, at last the perfect sponsor came along and the good times were about to roll for Christianity in China. 1260 to 1294, Kublai Khan reigned as Kagan of the Mongol Empire and starting in 1271 as Emperor of China. Like the Taizong Emperor, Kublai Khan was very curious and open-minded about foreign religions and welcomed all of them to his enlightened court. Thanks to his mother and his principal consort, Empress Chabi, both pious Nestorian Christians, that religion had the inside track as far as who the great Khan particularly showed benevolence towards. And so began this second major coming of Christianity to China. In China, during the times of Kublai Khan, preaching the gospel far and wide across China became possible once again. This time, unlike in the Tang, there were more Christians in China than just those from the Nestorian church. Let me tell the story of Rabban Barsama and Rabban Marcos. Rabban was an Aramaic term that meant master or teacher or rabbi. They were both Angut Mongols, a tribe who lived up in what is today Ordos and Balto in Inner Mongolia. And this particular tribe of Mongols, more than any other, seemed to particularly embrace Nestorian Christianity. Most likely Uyghurs were the ones who brought this religion to the Mongols. A few of the sources I came across said Barsama and Marcos were Uyghur Turks. Hard to say. So Rabban Barsama and his younger colleague, Rabban Marcos, were both from this area originally. But they lived in Kanbalik, in Da'du, the fabulous and over-the-top amazing capital of Kublai Khan that is today the seat of government for the People's Republic of China. And one day they decided that they would leave Kanbalik and make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And once there, they would visit all the holy sites and seek absolution for their sins whatever they might have been. In the year 1260, the two men went and gave away all their possessions to the poor and arranged to join a caravan departing for the West. This, of course, was a well-worn route by now, and they traced the southern route of the Silk Road all the way to the key city of Kashgar. And from Kashgar, Rabban Barsama and Rabban Marcos traced the routes previously taken by countless others going back to the days of Han Wu Di in the 1st century BCE. And eventually, they made their way to Baghdad. And because of all the fighting going on in the Holy Land with the Fifth Crusade and all, it became impractical for these two ascetic monks to continue on to their destination. So they settled themselves in Baghdad and waited things out. As fate would have it, Whilst the two were residing in Baghdad, the patriarch of the Church of the East died suddenly. And so in 1281, unexpectedly, Rabban Marcos was selected as the new patriarch and served till 1370. And so in 1281, unexpectedly, Rabban Marcos was selected as the new patriarch and served until 1317. And he became known as Yab Alaha III. These were tumultuous times, as we all know. Late 13th century, 
from the First Crusade beginning in 1096 up to the ill-fated Eighth and Ninth Crusades of San Louis the Ninth in 1270 and Edward the First in 1271-1272, it had been one and three-quarter centuries that the Christians and Muslims had been going at each other. The scourge of the Christians and the Mongols were the Mamluks of Egypt. The Mongol Ilkhan ruler, Argun Khan, had been trying to create a kind of Mongol-European alliance against their common enemy, the Mamluks. You remember his khanate was called the Il Khanate. This was the one passed on to Hulagu from his father to Louis, who was given it by his father, Genghis Khan. The Il Khanate comprised much of what is Western Asia. So Argun Khan, who, by the way, up until his deathbed was a Nestorian Christian, met with Rabban Marcos, now the all-powerful patriarch of the East, Yabalaha III, and requested him to send an envoy to the courts of Europe to seek out a Mongol-European alliance. So this patriarch, uh, this title is also known as the Catholicos uh, in the Eastern Church, he said he knew just the Mongol ambassador to send for this mission. He recommended Rabban Barsama to head up this Mongol embassy to Europe. So, off Rabban Barsama went. He left Baghdad and sailed to Constantinople, sailing through the Bosphorus, taking in the sights and lingering for a bit. Whilst there, he met the Emperor Andronicus II. Spread good cheer. It wasn't every day that someone from this far away came to visit and representing so high and mighty of a ruler, the Argon Khan. From there... He moved on to the continent, first sailing through the Aegean Sea, then past Sicily on June 18th, 1287, 655 years to the day before you know who was born. And he sailed past the east coast of Sicily, where he witnessed a minor volcanic eruption and saw smoke rising out of Mount Etna. He had written, quote, smoke ascended all the day long, and in the nighttime fire showed itself on it, end quote. Rabban Barsama finally made his way to Rome, only to find that the Pope, Anarius IV, had just died, and the next pontiff, who was to become Nicholas IV, had not yet been chosen. So, Rabban Barsama figured he'd push onwards and double back later to see if a new Pope had been elected. Argon Khan was insistent that he meet with the Pope, so he knew he had to find a way to make this meeting happen. If he returned home without having seen the Pope and had not passed on the letters from the Khan, he knew he'd have a lot of explaining to do. So he went to Tuscany and Genoa and then on to France, where he met with Philip the Fair. Now, many of you know this French king as the one who did in the Knights Templars on Friday the 13th, 1307. He was also no friend of the Jews and expelled them from France a year before he did in the Knights Templar. Philip met with Rabban Barsama and was most receptive to what Argon Khan was proposing. He sent a representative to accompany Rabban Barsama back to the Ilkhanat to keep this discussion going with the Mongol leader. Plenty of talk, but in the end, nothing really ever came of it, and this whole idea of a Mongol-European alliance remained only a pipe dream. After meeting with Philip the Fair... The next stop was Bordeaux in Gascony, where he met with Edward I, Edward Longshanks, sponsor of the last and final crusade. He was at loggerheads with Philip the Fair when Rabban Barsama met with him. The English king gave him a warm reception and said he was all for the notion of this grand alliance with the Mongols. Anything that could assist him in his wars was most welcomed by Edward. And by this time, Nicholas IV had just been made the new pope. So, Rabban Barsama, this Mongol ambassador from the court of Argon Khan, returned to Rome and met with the Holy Father. And there in Rome, Rabban Barsama also got to enjoy the good company of his colleagues from the Western Church. And they were most anxious to meet this man from so far away and to no doubt argue the fine points of their respective Western and Eastern doctrines and theology. The Pope even invited Rabban Barsama to celebrate the Divine Liturgy to everyone in order that they may experience how they did it out in Yuan Dynasty, China. 
The divine liturgy is the Eucharistic service and mass used by the Eastern Orthodox churches. Rabban Barsama, while he was in Rome, even sought out and received communion from the Pope himself. Hey, why not? Everyone had what could only be described as a spiritually jolly good time. The Pope passed on a token holy relic to this ambassador of the Khan, and also presented some new vestments and a crown for Rabban Barsama's former traveling companion, the Patriarch Yabalaha III. Pope Nicholas IV also made a proclamation that named Rabban Barsama Apostolic Visitor to the East. Thereupon, he returned to Baghdad and remained there till the end of his days, passing in 1294. When he and Rabban Marcos had set out from Kanbalik, Marco Polo was heading in the opposite direction towards China. Now, as Barsama headed back to Baghdad, Marco Polo was on his way back to Venice. One went one way, and one went the other. But only one of the two travelers' stories got turned into a miniseries. Rabban Barsama wrote a book of these travelers that was translated in 1928. It had the robust title of The Monks of Kublai Khan, Emperor of China, or The History of the Life and Travels of Rabban Salma, Envoy and Plenipotentiary of the Mongol Khans to the Kings of Europe, and Marcos, who, as Mar Yabalaha III, became Patriarch of the Nestorian Church in Asia. Wow, you almost don't have to read the book now. Let me just finish off this second period in Chinese history when Christianity came to the Middle Kingdom and flourished for a while. The pilgrimage of Rabban Salma and Marcos went from China to Europe. There was also a notable journey made by Giovanni Montecorvino, who lived from 1246 to 1329. This would make him 26 years younger than Rabban Barsama. He's better known amongst English speakers as John of Montecorvino. He was entrusted by Pope Nicholas IV, the same one who had met Barsama, to go to the near and far east to preach Christianity to the Asian hordes. And so John of Montecorvino set out from Rome in the year 1289 in the capacity of a papal legate to the Mongol Khans. A legate is just a personal representative of the Pope to foreign nations. So late 13th century, he took off and traveled to Persia, then to India to continue the work begun there by St. Thomas more than a thousand years earlier. And wherever he went, he preached and brought people over to his faith. One major setback, what this whole long journey was all leading up to, the big moment, was the meeting with Kublai Khan. Well, it didn't happen. By the time John of Monte Carvino pulled into Kanbalik, modern-day Beijing, the great Khan and benefactor in China to many of the great religions of the world, had just died. And the succeeding emperor wasn't a big fan of foreign religions like his grandfather Kublai, but he tolerated them. And thanks to this continued tolerance during the post-Kublai Khan Yuan dynasty era, the church continued to enjoy relative smooth sailing in China. Remember, the pioneers of Christianity in China were the Nestorians, and John of Montecorvino came from the Western Church in Rome, so they were, well, I guess you could say, competitors. You see, in 1245 and again in 1253, Pope Innocent IV sent some Franciscan missionaries to try and preach to the Mongols. They tried, but nothing ever came of it. But one thing the Franciscans were able to report when they got back to Rome was that the Nestorians had a major leg up on them as far as converts amongst the Mongols. Despite their seniority, however, the Nestorians were not successful in using all their connections and influence to block John of Montecorvino's progress. Even with all this resistance, John built two Roman Catholic churches in Kanbalik, one in 1299 and another in 1305. While he was busy digging the foundations of the Roman Catholic Church in Kanbalik, he also mastered the several languages of the Chinese diplomatic world and even translated the Bible into Uyghur. As the records show, he claimed about 6,000 converts. In 1308, Pope Clement V had John of Montecorvino consecrated as Archbishop of Kanbalik. 
He had established churches in both Beijing and in Fujian province, in the cities of Xiamen and Quanzhou. With the tools he had and the speed of transport and communication back in the late 13th, early 14th century, it boggles the mind to try and get your arms around the magnitude of such an achievement. John of Montecorvino, not a terribly well-known person from history, but what an incredible dynamo as far as his faith and his industry in building the church in China. Even after he died in Beijing in 1328, the work he started kept moving forward for another four decades. Yeah, 40 years. You know where that puts us. 1368. A milestone year in Chinese history, the year Zhu Yuanzhang and his armies sent the Mongols packing and put a Han Chinese back on the dragon throne. And Zhu Yuanzhang, after he declared himself the first emperor of the Ming Dynasty, came out with an edict that expelled the Christians from China. Again, the Yuan Dynasty had been a wonderful period for Christianity. The propagation of the faith was freely allowed both during and after Kublai Khan. And the Pax Mongolica of the 13th and 14th centuries ushered in a period of relative ease and communication and going from place to place across great distances. Christian missionaries of all kinds were able to take advantage of this and do their work less hindered by war and chaos. But Zhu Yuanzhang, the Hongwu emperor, he didn't trust them and had them expelled. The Christians and Manichaeans, everyone scattered, or as many Christians were wont to do since Roman times, they went underground and laid low. Jews and Muslims, by the way, were allowed to stay. So Christianity came and went in the Tang Dynasty with Alopen, and now again in the Yuan. The Ming Dynasty would remain mostly free of Christianity until the arrival in 1582 of Ruggieri and Ricci. And Matteo Ricci would have to wait until 1601 before he ever got to see the Forbidden City as an advisor to the court of the Wanli Emperor. So we can see the founder of the dynasty mentioned many times in these China History podcasts, kicked the Christians out as soon as he founded the Ming. Now all the details of this third coming of Christianity to China were already discussed in the past CHP episode 98 on Ricci, Schall von Bell, and Verbeest. I'm not going to say much except to mention the main bullet points of this time. Now, of course, in the time of the Jesuits, the Protestant Reformation had already taken place, so there was an additional urgency to open up new vistas for the Roman Catholic Church. In the late Ming Dynasty, there were no vistas more vast than in China. Thanks to their go-slow approach their scholarship, willingness to share their wisdom, their calculated adoption of Chinese ways, and most importantly, their usefulness to the Ming and later Qing imperial court. All of this contributed to the Jesuits' success in gaining a degree of acceptance. No one is more recognized as more crucial to the success of the Jesuits in China during this late Ming dynasty period than the three great pillars of Chinese Catholicism. These were Xu Guangqi, Li Zhizhao, and Yang Tingyun. All three men were around the same age. Xu Guangqi is probably the most famous of the three. He is immortalized in most of the history books as Paul Xu. At first it was science and scholarship that brought the Jesuits and the scholar officials in the Ming government together. Later, these three Chinese will join the Jesuits in adopting their faith. Li Zhizhao, better known in the West as Lian Li, was the one, by the way, who in 1625, when they dug the Nestorian stele out of the ground, was the first to publish the Chinese and Syriac writing. Lian Li and his colleague Yang Tingyun were primarily responsible for bringing Catholicism to Hangzhou, where it became one of the centers of Jesuit scholarship. Yang Tingyun was responsible for funding the first church in Hangzhou, as well as a Jesuit cemetery. So by the time of the outset of the Qing dynasty, the Jesuits in China had managed to make themselves welcome at the imperial court and had converted some key Chinese locals who were invaluable in the success that the Jesuits had in the 16th and 17th centuries. And also thanks to the regent Dorgan, the emperor Xunzhi, and his son Kangxi, the skids really got a nice greasing as far as the 
Jesuits being able to effectively carry out their work in the early decades of the Qing dynasty. As I said, this is all rehash from that previous episode on Ricci, Shalvan Bell, and Verbeest, so I won't go into the details. The Jesuits took a top-down approach. Ricci and the other Jesuits used a very subtle approach in their teaching. They always looked for ways to draw parallels between their faith and the accepted Chinese traditional Confucianist ways. They tried to create some kind of spiritual bridge that would attract Chinese converts to their faith. If he had to bend the rules a little or look the other way at some things for the sake of a bigger picture, Ricci and his Jesuit brothers in China felt justified to do so. After arriving in China and getting the lay of the land, Ricci and his Jesuit brothers knew the Roman Catholic shoe was not going to fit on this Chinese foot unless it got softened up in a few places. And therein lies the rub. That was the one thing that was going to lead to a cease and desist order from the higher-ups back in Rome. Competing head-to-head -head with the Jesuits in China were the Order of Preachers, better known as the Dominican Order. They didn't see eye-to-eye -eye with the Jesuits on this matter of allowing Chinese Catholic converts to continue to dabble in various native traditions and rites of a Chinese Confucianist nature. This was one of those core core Chinese beliefs, honoring your ancestors in a certain way. That was a real deal-breaker whenever it came down to that one issue. Ricci said, let them continue to worship their ancestors in their way. The Dominicans said, the Chinese converts had to take it all as is, with no adapting or get-arounds. Starting in 1645, one year into the Qing dynasty, the Dominicans teamed up with the Franciscans, and they brought this matter to the papal authorities in Rome. Naturally, the Pope got involved. So did everyone else in Europe who wanted to weigh in on this matter. It became known as the Chinese Rites Controversy. In 1704, four decades into the reign of the Kangxi Emperor, Pope Clement XI banned the practice of these non-Catholic rites that some Chinese converts continued to practice. And for good measure, Pope Benedict XIV reaffirmed them 38 years later. Now, when the Kangxi Emperor was told by a papal legate that it was our way or the highway, he took rather extreme measures. This emperor had been a good friend of the Jesuits, and by extension to Roman Catholicism as well. The Jesuits that served in various capacities at his court made all kinds of selfless contributions working with their Chinese colleagues in the field of the sciences. Kangxi had even issued an Edict of Toleration in 1692. So the Jesuits had carved out a very nice presence in China. Many argued with their methods of accommodating established Chinese traditions and sensibilities with their Catholic faith. And there were detractors as well who opposed the Jesuits' strategy of focusing their missionary work with the top echelons of power in society, rather than working from the bottom up. But you have to hand it to them. They really got in good with the right emperor. Kangxi was the longest reigning emperor in Chinese imperial history. 61 years. And there's a footnote, of course, next to the word longest, as we all know from past CHP episodes. Alapan had Tang Taizong during the Yuan Dynasty. John of Monte Corvino and others enjoyed the benefits of Kublai Khan's support and the whole Pax Mongolica and the Jesuits were granted acceptance by both the Ming and Qing emperors. That was really all you needed, a powerful backer to protect you and allow you to do your work. But there were three big setbacks. In Tang Dynasty China, everything stopped in 845 with the Wuzong Emperor's Edict. Then, after the Mongols were chased out of China for a second time, Christianity experienced a setback with this eviction notice given by the Hongwu Emperor. And now... For the third time, with the stroke of a pen, the Kangxi Emperor lashed out at Pope Clement XI's papal bull issued March 19, 1715, and in that one simple act, carried out in an instant, things immediately went south for Christianity in China. In 1721, the Kangxi Emperor, a year before his death, did the same thing the Ming Hongwu Emperor did back in 1368. And I will read, once again, like I did back in that Qing Dynasty and 
Three Jesuits episode, the Kangxi Emperor's response to Clement XI's condemnation of these Chinese rites. Quote, Reading this proclamation, I have concluded that the Westerners are petty indeed. It is impossible to reason with them because they do not understand larger issues as we understand them in China. There is not a single Westerner versed in Chinese works, and their remarks are often incredible and ridiculous. To judge from this proclamation, their religion is no different from other small, bigoted sects of Buddhism or Taoism, and I have never seen a document which contains so much nonsense. From now on, Westerners should not be allowed to preach in China to avoid further trouble. End quote. The Kangxi Emperor, ladies and gentlemen. And when the Kangxi Emperor's son, who we know as the hardworking Yongzheng Emperor, sat himself down on the throne, he made it official. All Christians expelled, all their property confiscated, countless churches destroyed. Another example to add to the colossal pile of historical backlashes. And the Yongzheng Emperor's fourth son, the Qianlong Emperor, he didn't allow any Christians to spread the gospel either. So it stayed pretty quiet throughout the Qing Dynasty up until the immortal Robert Morrison arrived in Macau, September 4th, 1807. And we're going to lower the curtain right here and leave the story of the 19th and 20th century missionaries in China to another day. In this episode, I only wanted to look back on the stories that preceded this more modern period of Christianity in China. From CHB 98 on the Jesuits, we already had an idea about that part of the history of Christianity in China. But everything that came before that, that's what I primarily wanted to focus on. The big picture story is about this 1,000-year arc of history and the three periods when people of different Christian faiths came to China started to bring people over to Jesus, and then before the roots could take hold, got swept away by the tide of history. There are today anywhere between 70 to 100 million Christians in China, which proves the old adage that faith and perseverance works. You had to start somewhere, and today's episode looked at those earliest efforts. I left out quite a bit, but I didn't want to start having to explain the doctrinal differences between the different Christian faiths. And for that reason, I didn't get into too much detail about the Nestorians and Nestorius and why they split with the church in Rome. Once again, if anything in particular piques your interest, there's plenty you can follow up on if you so desire. Okay, let me just uh, put in a non-too-subtle plug for two of our other shows here at the Teacup Media Empire, the Chinese Sayings Podcast, easy to digest stories behind some of the more famous Chinese sayings, easy to learn, four syllables long, guaranteed to break the ice at parties. The China Vintage Hour for lovers of 19th century travel writing, I will bring you stories from Westerners who went to China during the Qing Dynasty and left us eyewitness accounts of many of the things they saw and observed. Also, if you want to keep up on what's going on here in Cali and the People's Republic of China, may I humbly recommend Matt Sheehan's Chinafornia newsletter, your weekly digest of news connecting the Golden State and the Middle Kingdom. I'll put a link to that on my webpage for this episode. You could just get on the Google and let Larry and Sergey find the Chinafornia newsletter for you. A recent Seneca featured John Ju of the Three Kingdoms podcast. A lot of you have written to me over the years asking me for more info on the Three Kingdoms period and about Luo Guanzhong's book. I always point you in the direction of John's podcast. ThreeKingdomsPodcast.com. That's the number three. ThreeKingdomsPodcast.com. Want to learn about that great book, one of the great classic novels of all time. John Jew, the Three Kingdoms Podcast.com. Okay, me little beauties, I know you're all busy, and I'm thankful you gave me this much of your time, so let me stop yammering away here. On behalf of the whole team who puts this out faithfully each episode, thank you from the bottom of my heart, CHP listeners old and new. This is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from the western coast of the land of the free and home of the brave, please consider coming back next time, won't you, for another healthy and satisfying dose of the China History Podcast.